Good morning, church. And Happy New Year, by the way. Didn't get to see you guys last week, and so it's good to see you be back with everyone this week. Uh, and it is a blessed day today to be in the house of the Lord. This morning, we are going to return to our study in the book of Revelation. We had taken a bit of a break, so if you have your Bibles, if you would go ahead and find your, open your Bible to the book of Revelation. That is the last book of the Bible. And while you're turning there, I just want to do a bit of a recap of what we've seen so far throughout this book. So far, the Apostle John is our writer. So the Apostle John is our writer, and he opens this book by letting us know right away that this is going to be about Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. So that's Revelation 1.1. <laughs> so revelation, if you remember, is actually the Greek word apocalypsis or apocalypsis, and it means an unveiling, it means a revealing is what that word really means. And so what's being revealed here is Jesus as God the Son. We're seeing Jesus as God the Son. Now before, throughout the Gospels, as we read through the Gospel accounts, we see a meek and yet bold suffering servant. We see Jesus also pictured as the Lamb of God who would be willingly sacrificed for the sin of the world. But now, in this glorious vision, we see Jesus glorified. We see him glorified in all power and in all majesty. And Jesus gives John this vision <laughs> so that he would send it out to the seven churches of Asia. Asia Minor, actually. Now, Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey, and so whenever you read where these, are, these letters are going to, Asia Minor, that's modern-day Turkey. And the reason why is because the churches at that time were experiencing a great persecution. They were under a great persecution, and Jesus, he wanted them to know that he knows everything that they're going through. He knows everything that's going on, and that he is still with them. In spite of their sufferings, he's still with them. And church, Jesus' message is the same for, for you and me today and for the church today. In spite of the suffering that you may be going through, Jesus is still with you. That's the first thing that he wants the church to know. Next, he's going to give commendations to the church. He's going to say, you've done this well so far, you're doing this. But then also, Jesus is going to give corrections to the church, which again, this shows that Jesus is intimately familiar with each and every church body. He's, he's, going, he's, he's familiar with what's happening here in Franklinville Wesleyan Church, but he's also just as familiar as what's happening in China right now, in Africa, in Europe, and every part of the world. He is intimately familiar with each and every church body body. And so then, after that, he's also going to give what's a possibly a near and a far prophecy. Now, if you remember, we kind of talked about this when I say near or far. As I mentioned before, in one of the earlier sermons of Revelation, is that there are different ways that you can interpret the book of Revelation. There's not one definitive way. Now, obviously, there is a correct way, but it's been debated throughout the years. And there are three basic ways to look at Revelation. There's more, but the three basic ones are this. There's a pre-tribulation or pre-millennial view. And that just that theology holds that revelation, it's all future events. There will be a coming antichrist. There will be a literal 1,000 millennial year reign of Jesus Christ here on earth before the final battle and before the great white throne judgment. That's the pre-millennial view or pre-trib view. Then comes the post-millennial view. This theology views the events of Revelation as already taken place. In other words, it already happened. This was Revelation that if you hold a post-millennial view, they see this as referring to Caesar Nero. And then they see the millennium not as a literal 1,000 years, but more of a figurative term. And they believe that this millennial reign of Christ began when the creation of the church happened. And now what's going to happen is that as the gospel goes forward throughout the world, the world is going to gradually become more and more Christian. And then once the entire world has become Christianized, then Jesus will, turn, will return to reign over the world. Now, I don't personally, you may hold that view, I do not, because I think when we look out in the culture, we do not see the world becoming more and more Christian. We see it just the opposite. But there is scriptural references that you can use to back up a post-millennial view. But then the third one is the amillennial view, and most people reject this view in that that view uh, views Revelation as just all allegorical. There's 
no literal sense at all. It's just all allegory. So most people reject that one outright. But there are still those that hold to an amillennial view. And again, my personal belief, though, as I mentioned before, is that Revelation could actually be a near and a far prophecy, and that would tie in the pre- and the post-millennial view. In other words, yes, Revelation, as John writes it, can absolutely be describing Caesar Nero. And there are ways that you see that throughout Scripture. When you look at the number of the beast, 666, and you add that up and you do the numerology and all that, it does spell out Nero in there. So it could have been code and all this could have definitely taken place. And that's what it could have been about. But if you remember, prophets had what was called near and far prophecies. In other words, if a prophet said, well, thus says the Lord, a thousand years from now, this is going to happen, there'd be no way of knowing if that's true. And so God would give them a near prophecy, something very similar to what's happening, that would prove their message is true. And so then the logical step from that is, well, if the prophet said this, and it has definitely happened, then that's probably going to be true as well. So that's the near and the far prophecy. So that could be what this is. Yes, it points to Caesar Nero, but it could also be foreshadowing the ultimate evil end times antichrist in the future. But either way, the message that Jesus wants his church to know is that he's going to be victorious. He's going to be victorious. Whether it's about Nero or whether it's about this coming antichrist in the future, Jesus says, I'm going to be victorious. And he will return and he will make all things right. So that's what he wants the church to know. And where we left off last time, if you remember, we we're in verse number 8, Jesus had put his signature on everything. In other words, John says all this, and then Jesus comes along and he signs off on it, saying, yep, everything you just read is true. In verse 8, if you're in Revelation 1 now, you look at verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was, who is to come, the Almighty. So he is the Alpha and the Omega. He, in other words, he is the A to the Z. Remember, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega the last letter. In English terms, you could say he's the A to the Z, and he's everything in between. He is also the beginner. He is the uncreated creator. He is the beginner of all things that is and was and will be. Jesus is the beginning. He is the, the uncreated creator. But then he says that he is also the end. What Jesus Christ began as he spoke time, space, and matter into existence, he is going to see through until the conclusion of all things. He says of himself as Lord and Sovereign that he is who he is, who was, and who is to come. In other words, he is eternally present. Jesus is always here. He is not the I was or I will be, but the I am. He, that's who he is. In other words, there never was and there never has been and nor will there ever be a time where Jesus is not present in his creation. He is the almighty God, he says in himself. He is El Shaddai, as it would have said in the Hebrew scriptures. He is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, he is always present, and he is always Lord. You do not make Jesus Lord. He is always Lord already. Amen. Now, let's look to John's testimony of what happened on that day. So that's a recap of where we've gotten to so far. So let's dig right in. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Look what John writes. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, first off, here again, John identifies himself. It's the third time in just in this um, nine verses that John has identified himself. But here, not only does he say he's John, he says, I, John. In other words, he is so amazed that he has been given this amazing vision, this spectacular revelation, that he says, I, John. In other words, I can't believe it. Can you believe I got this? Me, who am I? If you remember back in Daniel, Daniel had a similar response. When Daniel received his vision, remember before, he had just interpreted dreams and visions. But then God gave him a vision, and he said the same thing. I, Daniel, received this vision. It's like he's saying, I, John, can you believe it? I mean, God blessed me that way? He couldn't believe that he was blessed with such a mighty task of receiving and recording and then sharing this vision. And he wants the church to know, listen, I'm your brother. I am your fellow companion. I am no better than you, is what he's saying. He's saying, we're in this all together. 
Just because I'm an apostle is what he's trying to convey. And by the way, at this point, he's the last living apostle. They're all dead. He's the last one. He's saying, listen, even though I'm the apostle, he's saying, it's not like I get an easy life free of suffering. It's not like I get out of, uh, a get-out-of-jail-free card. I don't get to uh, live a life that's free of suffering and trials. No, he writes, I, John, both your brother and your companion. And then here, John, he's coming in this, this lowly humility. He's understanding the weight of this glorious burden that he's been given. And what a glorious burden it is. And you know the amazing thing about the Word of God? Is that the Word of God relates to us. It relates to us. You know, I'm always amazed when I, I hear people, they say that, well, you know, the Bible is not really relevant today. We need, what we need to do is, is we need to, to add to the Bible. Maybe we need to take some of the older things out of there because it just doesn't relate. It doesn't fit into our times. That amazes me when people say that. And church, not only is that kind of talk ridiculous and absurd, it's also blasphemous. I mean, think about it. If Jesus is who he just told us that he is, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty, then he and his written word, they are eternally relevant. There's never a time that his word is not relevant. And right here in verse 9, this is a great example. Look at, look at how John, back in first century, relates to the church in his day and with us today. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion in what? He says, in tribulation. I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. And this, this is written in a present tense. In other words, he's not talking about a future tribulation or a past tribulation. He says, I am with you now, right now in tribulation. I am your brother. I am your fellow companion in trials, in persecutions, and sufferings. How many of you have been or are going through trials? How many of you have been or are going through persecution or, or maybe you're suffering today? Well, yeah, me too. And then, and then John says, guess what? Me too. We can relate to one another. I'm your fellow brother. I'm your fellow companion. But then notice that he also, he writes that he's a brother and fellow companion in the kingdom. He wants you to know that we all share as believers in the spiritual kingdom. We're all together. We're all one in Jesus Christ. This world, this temporary place that we live, this is not our home, by the way. Amen. I mean, we live here now, physically and temporally, we, we live here now, but this is not our home. We belong to a heavenly kingdom. If you're in Jesus Christ today, this is not your home. Heaven is your home. Yes. In God's presence is your home. Peter writes it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Listen to what Peter writes. Beloved, I beg you, as strangers... And pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Church, if you're in Christ today, we're strangers. We are pilgrims in this world. We are just passing through. You should not feel comfortable or at home in this wicked and perverse world. You should look out at the culture and the landscape and go, this disgusts me. I do not feel at home here. I do not feel that I have anything in common. I just, it's frustrating almost. Because we know this is not where we are supposed to be. And don't get me wrong, yes, this world has a lot of beauty. I love the beach, I love the mountains, I love, I love the sunrise and the sunset. There is a lot of beauty in God's creation. So yes, there's beauty, there's, it, ha it has enduring aspects. The relationships we build with family and friends and our pets and all these things. You know, we have, there are enduring aspects, but the world system is what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the world system. This, this reprobate culture, all the evils and the perversions, it should make us repulsed. It should make us repulsed, and it should make us actually long for our heavenly home. 
When we look out in the news and we see the things going on in our culture and in the government and all these things, it should make us long for our heavenly home. It's kind of like this, if you've ever been a soldier, if you've ever been deployed overseas. And if you think about soldiers being deployed overseas, especially in a time of war, they know that they have a job to do. There is a, a, a job that they have to do while they're there. But they also know that the land that they're doing battle in, that land is not their home. When soldiers were overseas, when they were in Vietnam, when they were in Europe, when they were in Asia, when they were in the Middle East, wherever it was, and they were doing battle and they had things they had to do, they knew, this is not my home. I am over here temporarily and I am doing battle right now. And they longed for the day that they could just lay down their arms and return home. And as Christians, church, we're on the battlefield right now. This world is a battlefield. It's a battle for the souls of men and women and children. There is a very real battle going on. And this world, this kingdom right now, this kingdom is not ours. We belong to a heavenly kingdom. Notice thirdly, John writes that he's also your brother, your companion in the patience or in the perseverance of Jesus Christ. This Greek word uh, for patience, perseverance, however your Bible translates it. The Greek word, though, it speaks of endurance. It speaks of perseverance in difficult times. God's word can relate to you that way. It can relate to your patience. It can relate to your endurance and your perseverance in the faith. I mean, through good times, through bad times, through sickness and through health, through wealth and poverty, through love and through loss, even through life and death. God's word is there for you to help you in any of these matters. And John says that he's your brother and your companion. And, and God's word, he wants you to know you're not alone. You're in good company. You are in great company. But then that begs the question, then how do you endure? How do you, how do you endure? How do you persevere through trials and sufferings and persecutions and all these things? Well, the apostle Paul, he tells us. He tells us exactly how. Philippians chapter 4. He, listen to what Paul says. He says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he goes on to say, I can do all things through who? Christ. Through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. Jesus is our strength. Yes. Jesus is our patience. Jesus is our endurance. So we look to him. We don't do it in our own power. Our own need. Sometimes when we say, you know what? I don't need God. I don't need his word. I don't need Jesus. I am going to just try and do things on my own. I think I can do it. I can pull up my bootstraps. I believe at times like that, God will actually remove his hand and say, if you want it, here you go. See how well you do. And when I get that way, I fail miserably. And I get to the point where I'm like, I'm sorry, God. I was so arrogant and prideful. I need you, Lord. I can't do this on my own. We, I think a lot of times we take for granted everything that Jesus does for us. We don't see it. We don't get it. Until those times that he kind of steps back and says, well, if you want to be in complete control, I'm going to let you have some of that control. And we find out quickly how little control we actually have. But John continues. Look at verse 9. He says that he was on the island that is called Patmos. And remember, Rome had tried to kill him. Rome was just fed up with John. They wanted to kill him. First, they literally stuck him in a big vat of boiling oil. If you ever burned your hand on oil or anything like that, you know how bad when you're cooking and oil gets on your hand, you know how bad that hurts. They actually put him in a vat of that, and God protected him. And that wasn't good enough, so then what they had to do, they had to drink poison. It didn't affect him at all. And so they're like, you know what? Just get rid of him. Just get rid of this guy. And so Rome exiles John to this rocky little island in the Aegean Sea. It's between Greece and Turkey, if you know geography where that's at. This little island is only 13.18 miles in circumference. That would be the distance of traveling from Franklinville to Julian, maybe the outskirts of Liberty. So it's not very far at all. 
It's a really tiny island. And he's there all by himself. He's all by himself. Now, for some of you, that might be like, that'd be great. <laughs> Just get away from everybody. But he was by himself. And what was his crime? What did this man do that they tried to boil him alive, made him drink poison, and then finally cast him as an exile out in the middle of the sea on a little rocky island? He tells us, look at verse 9. He's there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, the word of God, that refers to the, the preaching of the Hebrew Scriptures because that was what they preached through. That was the Bible that Jesus and the apostles and the disciples used. It was the Old Testament. It's the only one they had at the time. The New Testament was being developed and being written. But, of course, the testimony of Jesus Christ, that refers to the gospel proclamation. He was talking about the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus and his sovereign lordship over all of creation. Now, people in the Roman Empire, they were actually commanded to say, Caesar is Lord. They were told to say it. They were commanded to say it under penalty, penalty of death at times. But Christians refused to bow their knee in submission to Caesar. And instead, they said, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. So John's exiled because he presented the full counsel of God. He preached the Old Testament scriptures that were pointing to the long-awaited coming King and Messiah. And then at the same time, he's, he's given the gospel testimony revealing who this Messiah and Lord is. It's Jesus Christ. And because of his unwavering testimony and allegiance to Jesus alone, he is cast out of society and abandoned on this little bitty rocky island called Patmos, which, by the way, in Greek, Patmos means my killing. So they wanted to send him there just so he would die. But now I want you to understand something. By doing this to John, Rome's goal was to crush his spirit. They wanted, to cry. they wanted him to die, but they also wanted him to die internally. They wanted to crush him. They wanted to physically crush him. They wanted to mentally crush him, emotionally, and even spiritually. We're going to cast you out so you're alone. You can't talk to anybody. There was no friends, no family, no church, nothing and no body. No possessions. It's just him. But now look what it says. Look what John writes in verse 10. I was in the Spirit. So was John really alone on that island? No. no. The Spirit of God was with him. He was, in the, he was in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian today, there may be times you feel alone, but you're not alone. God is right there with you. Amen. His Spirit is with you. So John was not alone. He was in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, he was in a time of holy <laughs> communion with God Himself. Have you ever been a time where maybe you were either in, you maybe you were reading through the Word of God, maybe you were in a, in a time of prayer, maybe you were in worship and you were singing, and then you just feel this overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever had that experience before? Well, that's that's what was going on with John. That's where John was at. And then he says that he was, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, when is the Lord's Day? That's Sunday. It's the first day of the week, the, the day of our Lord's resurrection. It was not the Sabbath day. Sabbath day is separate. Sabbath day is the seventh day. That's Saturday. That's the day that, that God blessed us as, as the day of rest. We talked, Jeannie talked about that in our Sunday school lesson today. But Sunday came to be known in the early church as the Lord's Day. Because this, this is the day that Jesus resurrected. And so that's the day it's celebrated. So when you hear Lord's Day in Scripture, not Day of the Lord. That's talking about the day the Lord returns. But the Lord's Day. This is Sunday. It's the day we remember the resurrection. So again, this is Sunday. And John, he's in this sweet time of communion with the Holy Spirit. Then all of a sudden, look what happens. He hears behind him a loud voice almost like a trumpet. If you ever heard a trumpet blast, you know how loud that is. It's loud and, 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 and it has this, this, this piercing sound. And so that's what this voice is like. In other words, it gets your attention. It's a voice that got his attention. I mean, he's alone and then all of a sudden here's this booming, loud, clear voice behind him. And look at verse number 11. Look what it says. This voice says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see... Write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now notice here 
that Jesus' words are they're a little bit different than they were in verse number 8. Because here he declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and he calls himself, I am the first and the last. Now that's important. Why is that important? Because you can actually, if you're a note taker in your Bible, beside verse number 11, jot down this note. Jot down Isaiah 44, 6. Isaiah 44, 6. Because what's happening here is Jesus is connecting himself to Yahweh in the Old Testament, the Lord God. In Isaiah 44, 6, listen, this is, the, this is Yahweh. He's speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And God speaking through the prophet says this, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord Yahweh of hosts, he says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And so here, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. So Jesus is connecting himself to Old Testament prophecy again. So Isaiah 44, 6. I mean, that's a pretty powerful claim, right? And next time somebody tries to tell you, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, not only show them Revelation 1, 11, but then also take them back to Isaiah 44, 6 and connect that for them. But then Jesus... He commanded John to write in a book, more accurately, to write in a scroll. All that he will see, and then he says, send the message to seven very specific churches. These are in Asia Minor, again, it's modern day Turkey. But why these seven churches? Why these particular ones? I mean, there were, there were a lot more churches in Asia Minor, but they were, they were very specific. Why these seven? I want to give you a historical context as to why, but then I'm also going to probably, I mean, I'll briefly mention another reason why these specific churches. Number one, here's the historical context. Why these particular churches? Why these seven? It's because these seven were seven postal districts in the Asia Minor. There were seven postal districts. This would have made it easier and more efficient to disseminate the message. In other words, to get the message out. Historians also note that if you'll study a map of Asia Minor, of that area in that day, the order of the cities that Jesus gives, notice he gives a specific order, this is the exact route that a messenger would take if he was going to visit that area. So what would happen is a messenger, he would make that first stop in Ephesus because Ephesus was a seaport town. So he would come into Ephesus by the seaport. The church at Ephesus then, they would painstakingly copy word for word everything that John had written. So you would have a scribe in this church, and it would be their duty to write down everything that John would write. Once it was completed, then the messenger would roll up the scroll that John had written, and he would carry it on. He'd roll up, he'd, off, he'd head off to the next postal district, to Smyrna. And then that, they would repeat that same process until he had completed this entire circuit and made his way back. And of course, there were many, again, many other churches in the area of those districts. And so from this main postal area, they would go out to the district churches in their area to, to share in the letter. And again, those churches, they would receive the scrolls. All the churches in the surrounding areas, they would receive the scrolls. They would copy them, and then on and on it goes. And that is why today we have over 5,700 plus Greek copies of the New Testament scriptures. That's why. Because that's what they would do. And we also have copies in Latin, by the way. We have copies in Coptic and Sahidic and other translations, which actually gives us over 20,000 handwritten copies of the New Testament. 20,000 copies. So that's the first reason, the historical context, as to why these seven specific churches, they were postal districts. Number two... I believe that each of the seven churches represent a type of church from John's time until now. In other words, when we read through the letters to the churches, there were faithful churches. But there were also churches that were not faithful. There were unfaithful churches. And Jesus, again, he has commendations and he has warnings to pronounce to, to each of these different types of churches. And each one should give us a pause as we read through this in chapter 2 and 3. We should take a pause as we read his description of each to see where we fall as the church today. And then what lessons we need, what, what warning that we need to heed. 
But then John continues. Look at verse number 12. John writes, And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. What a glorious and a frightening and awe-inspiring vision. What an amazing vision. John's to see, John, he turns to see a vision of the spiritual realm. That's what he turns to see. One moment he's standing on the seashore, prayer and communion. He hears a voice and he turns around and his eyes are open and he can see into that invisible realm. The curtain is drawn back, in other words, and and John sees this glorified Jesus standing in the, in the midst of his church. That's what this vision of is Jesus standing in the midst of his church. And then what's the proper response to seeing Jesus, by the way, this way? Look at verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You know, when I'm out in the streets evangelizing and, and, and witnessing to people, I have to, to kind of laugh in a way because... There are people that say that, you know what, when I stand by, I've had people tell me this, when I, when I die or Jesus comes back, he's going to have a lot of explaining to do to me. And I'm going to stand up there and I'm going to point my finger at him. I'm going to demand that he give me an answer. People tell me that. And I have to laugh. I mean, what arrogance to say something like that. What, what foolishness. This is John we're reading of. This is Jesus' earthly friend. He's the one who, at the Last Supper, actually laid his head back on Jesus' chest. I mean, they were dear, dear friends. And when John, this dear friend, sees Jesus in all of his glory, he fell down as a dead man because he was so afraid of what he was seeing. And then sinful, rebellious human beings think they're going to wag their finger and scold Jesus. That's foolishness. That is the epitome of foolishness. You know what they will really be? They will really be a cowering puddle of fear and tears. That's what they will be. But how do we know that this is actually Jesus who's speaking here? How does he know? Well, look at verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. We read that already, right? I am he who lives, and then look, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. So is this a little more specific, right? He's the first and the last, God Almighty, Old Testament comparison. But then, just to be sure that we know this is Jesus who's speaking, he clarifies it, I am he who lives and was what? Was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. In other words, it is so. So we know, yes, this is, this one like the Son of Man, this is Jesus. But then remember I said that the vision is of Jesus standing amongst the church. So how do we know the lamp stands for the church? Well, again, Jesus tells us plainly. Look at the, look at the end of verse 20. <clears throat> he says, the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. He tells us exactly what have we seen. You know, people say, can't understand what Revelation means. Well, Jesus tells us. It's very plain. It's very plain. Now, there's a lot more here. There's a lot, lot more here. So what we're going to have to do is stop for today here. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to close out chapter 1. But we're given so much description of Jesus. And everything, by the way, did you know everything in your Bible means something? It's not just there to be there for no reason. There's actually... Very important meaning behind things. So I want to close out our time together today by just kind of tying everything together. Everything that we've talked about today, everything we've seen today in the Scriptures. I want you to think on this. If Jesus is truly standing in the midst of His church from John's time until now, what does that mean? That means that He's here right now. Jesus is standing right here right now. We can't physically see Him 
The veil's not been pulled back like it was for John. But he's here. And not only is he here in our midst today, but he sees each and every one of us. He sees each and every one of you. He sees me. He's in our midst today. He's intimately familiar with not only his church here in Franklinville, communally, but he's also standing alongside you individually as his church. Whether you're here today, you're at home, you're in your car, you're by yourself, you're not by yourself. He is there with you. He stands beside you. He sees you, he knows you, and guess what? If you're in Christ today, he loves you and he cares for you. You are not alone. That's what we get from this when we see Jesus standing in the midst of the lampstands. The lampstands is the church. You are the church. He is standing here. Saints of old, by the way, they can relate to your present tribulations, the things you're going through today. Saints of old, they can relate to you, to your present sufferings, to your joy, to your celebration. Saints of old can relate. They went through everything you're going through. But then also the Word of God can relate to you and to your life. And the Word of God can give you wisdom. You know, we read our, our proverb as our devotional for today. And you should read a proverb every day because Proverbs was written and designed to teach you how to deal with your fellow human beings. Because it's not always easy to do that. If you have any, any experience dealing with human beings, you know it's not easy. And so we read the Proverbs. But then also, we have the book of Psalms we read, which give praise and glory to God and extol Him. So God's Word can give you wisdom and guidance, and it can give you hope. And Jesus Himself, He can relate to you. Did you know that? God, what do you know about my suffering? What do you know about things that I'm going through? You're God. How can you possibly know? How can you relate to my life here in Franklinville or Archdale or Ashboro or wherever you're living? The book of Hebrews, the writer, he writes this. He says in, in Hebrews 4, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help him, or to help in time of need. Church, if God is for you, not against you, if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ today and you're born again, Christ is not against you. He is for you. And another thing we learn from this scripture portion today is that God, He wants to speak to you. Did you know that? Why do you think He told John, write this down? John, this isn't just for you. I want you to send this to the churches. And then 2,000 years ago in this little town in North Carolina, there are going to be Christians that need hope. And I want them to understand this too, that I am in their midst and I am with them. And I want to talk to you. God wants to speak. Jesus tells John, write, it, write down what you see so the church will know. God speaks to us today through His written word. He is not going to speak audibly to you today. He speaks to us through His written word and He wants to speak to you. All you have to do is open this book and read. And so that you will know him and his will. Because he wants you to know him and his will. Christ loves his church. Christ died for his <coughs> church. So if you ever think church is not important, Jesus died for his church. It is of critical importance. Therefore, take heart, fellow brother and fellow sister, fellow companion in Christ. That's what we are. We are together in this. And I want you to take these three words to your heart and lock them in. Jesus loves you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you first off that you loved us so much that you died for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that because our sin was so great that it took your life and your death that we may be forgiven. It took the death of God's own Son that we could be forgiven and be made right with the Father. And so, Lord, today we praise your holy name, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your written word that that is how you speak to us today, that you've not 
left us as orphans to not know. But you have given us your word so that we will know. So that we can come into fellowship with you and that we can come together united in this one faith together as brothers and sisters and fellow companions. And Lord God, if there's anyone today that does not know you as Lord and Savior and you do not know them as one of your children because your word says you're either a child of God or a child of wrath, there is no in-between. Convict them in their spirit today, Lord. That they come to you in true repentance and faith and cry out to you because you said if anyone who comes to you, you will in no ways turn them away. But you will welcome them and you will forgive them and redeem them and make them a new creation. Give them a new mind and a new heart and new desires. And so, Lord, we pray that today. Whether there's anyone here today or watching later on video on YouTube, either way, you are Lord of all. So we thank you and we praise you. It's in your great name we pray.